So now you also sent me an article. Oh yeah. Uh, say something. I think it's also good to be, to do like a job to be done or like a, a, a fake like diary study, right? With the first design hire that you have at that company or the first few designers, because you really want to talk to them about their experience. So when you're hiring the next person, you can start to have more of an understanding on, okay, this is who's going to fit, you know, the best in this organization, right? Just by the feedback that I've gotten from these individuals. So I wanted to point that out too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's such a great point because your very first hires or very first few hires are probably, you know, your test subjects, right? Because when you're first starting out, you're trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure it out. And after that initial run, uh, go around, both of you, hopefully, you know, both from the company side and from the employee side, they both learn something. And I think that's incredibly valuable from a startup perspective, right? Like, I, I guess from um, more of a big organization perspective, probably someone who's been there recently, right? Obviously, you can't trace back to 50 years ago. But um, yeah, like someone who's who's been with the team most recently, I think that's um, a good reflection of it. So going back to that article that you sent me, um, I think it was from quite a few years ago, uh, written by Tobias Van Schneider, who's uh, quite famous in the industry. He has written so many great articles. So he was saying there's uh, a disconnect between company expectations and uh, designers uh, and what's available out there. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about the article and what, um, a, you know, kind of what left an impression um, on you and why do you think, um, he made good points? Yeah. So I think there's a really great part and I'm, and I'm pulling the article up right now where he says that the, you know, part of the first part of it is that most companies I talk to are desperately looking to hire good designers. And most designers I talk to are desperately looking for work. Right. And there's a breakdown happening. And there's this really great part where he says, when hiring a designer, I look for a balance of hard skills, taste, in strategic thinking, that most designers check one or two requirements but lack the third. The designer may have the hard skills to take a project from start to finish, but lack strategic and holistic thinking, meaning that they're only good at what they do when they're told exactly what to do. And other designers yeah. may be able to think strategically, but they aren't able to execute it, execute on it, making them worthless yeah. for a company that needs a hands-on team, right? And he says, perhaps mm-hmm. we are indeed holding designers to an unrealistic standard, or maybe those designers exist and there aren't that many of them out there. And the ones that do exist are a part of the 20% that's happily, or 27% that's happily employed. So I still think that's a bigger issue today because especially mm-hmm. in this climate, companies are being really particular about what they want and they're trying yeah. to lowball people, right? And pay a lot of yeah. senior folks like junior entry level pay. And I think that what a lot of people really need to remember is that for, for me, is that I think if you're a person who can execute things really well, but you're also really great at strategic thinking, right, and holistic thinking, you will get far in your career. I don't think it's necessarily a full stack thing where you need to learn all these other different areas, right? But I think that in most environments, as long as you're, you know, putting the work out there, um, everything is going to be great. I, I do think that once again, companies, they do have unrealistic standards. And I think that a lot of folks that come, especially people that come from fame companies, right, and going to smaller startups as like managers and all of that, they expect to get the same type of talent or they expect, you know, the same quality designer or, you know, that perfect designer that went through like 13 rounds with Google or something, right? And they're just not going to get that as well. Because I think it's just realistic expectations of, oh, you have to have a really great portfolio and all of that. A lot of people don't have time to do that, right? Oh, you need to dedicate your time to learning about our company in in the interview. Once again, a lot of people don't have time to do that, and your company should be telling the interviewer, I mean, the person is interviewing, right, why they will be a great fit for their company, not the other way around, in my opinion. I think it's also things like, oh, you need to do this design challenge, or oh, you need to do this whiteboarding, or oh, you need to present your, you know, you need to have a 45-minute presentation for slide decks. And once again, it doesn't make any sense because like I brought up to you in another um, another podcast that there's a company where you only present one of your case studies in five minutes, you know, and that's yeah. brevity. And I think that's really great. And you don't even talk about the actual design work. You talk about the problems that you had to overcome in that case study, which is even better because they're asking for all this stuff. Right. But in my opinion, 
the the reason that product design is hard because it's the people right in the team that you have to work with and it's the product that you have to ship as well in order to great get great outcomes and i think when it comes to asking for all these different skill sets and all these different areas i strongly believe that even at a fame company like google for example um you're not going to do all that because think about gmail right think yeah, about gmail yeah. remember when a lot of people were getting a lot of people and, and this is a conversation for another day because i thought this was stupid when people say this oh how does gmail have like a bunch of you know talented designers working on it but they have different three shades of blue right in the compose <laughs> and, like, and all that different area but when you think about it with gmail and i read an interesting article that can gmail actually be redesigned right and if it did what problem or purpose would it solve can they do anything more with it and this person was saying no so think about being on a gmail team and all you're probably doing is iterating all day for stakeholders that's probably it and Pretty a lot much. of 99% of your iter and once again, I don't work at Google. I don't know, but just looking at Gmail, it seems like a lot hasn't been done unless it's like a lot of back end system stuff with, with the design team, right? But once again, yeah. it's like, okay, yeah, they can iterate all day, but what's actually going out there? And are they using the full life cycle design process, right? Are they using like research, right? Are they using user flows and all this kind of stuff? Probably 90% of it, no. Not at all. But they were, they had a criteria on that, right, Stella? When they were yeah. interviewing, the person <laughs> wanted to see that in their case study and their work. But now that they're working on this stuff, it's probably not even close to that. And even at a startup where you have to do everything, there's going to be things that you skip out on, right? When you think about it. Absolutely. And you can't do everything. And matter of fact, if you have to meet a deadline, there are, there is, and it's, it's the same with Google, which is ironic, right? You have like a full, you know, staff team of content creators, UX writers, all these other different people working in tandem with one another. But at a startup, you're doing all that stuff by yourself. But at the same time, once again, you're not going to use 90% of that stuff that companies are asking for from an end-to-end -end life cycle. So, Yeah, no, I, I, I remember a few days ago, you sent me a text um, with a screenshot of several tweets Basically, it's um, from hiring managers at two very prominent tech companies that we all know of, and they listed out their criteria for rejecting candidates, right? So they said, oh, we reject the candidates because they don't have this, they don't have that, um, which is, you know, I mean, from on the service, it sounds fair, right? Of course, you can reject them if they're not meeting those seemingly basic um, you know, criteria, for example, like, oh, system thinking or strategic thinking or, you know, product thinking or whatever it is, right, that you define that is so important. But if you've worked in any capacity, right, in, in the corporate world for more than a few years, you know, the uh, this might be unfortunate to hear for junior designers, but things are pretty much the same everywhere. Um, they're not, you know, of course, there are better culture, there are better environments in, you know, different companies. But from my decade of experience, I learned that everywhere is probably, um, you know, it, it's more or less the same. It's all a mess. And like you said, Carrie, you're not going to use everything but they think you will or at least they advertise that you will right so they they actually created a false expectation for you right like for for you after you join and you might be disappointed yourself um and and it's uh, this kind of leads to the interviewing uh experience as well because you touched upon it a little bit, like some companies make you do all these really long interviews, um, basically wasting a lot of your time. And especially if you, they don't hire you, you basically wasted probably months of your energy. Um, I, 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 I tend to agree with that as well, because I personally have experience um, with companies where they set out really specific criteria or deadline and they send you a really big project to do as a test project. Yes, it is not a project that they will ever use to profit or they will ever sell what you did, right? It's pretty, uh, uh, um, you know, obvious that they it, it is a test project. It is not related to their content, which is ethical. But then again, if a project takes 8, 10, or 20 hours of your time, that they really should be paying you for this. Um, and then I've, I've had experience with other companies that are doing this a little bit better. They only send 
one really tiny project, like a really tiny feature tweak for you to work on that only takes less than 60, well, they said you should take less than 60 minutes, right? To, to present what you can uh, come up with in that time frame. And I thought that's fair because, you know, if I, if I have some time during lunch, I can, you know, actually work on it. And it's such a small task. I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to do it for, for free, right? Like even that. And, and, and in, 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 in turn, the, the candidate experience is so much better. You feel, you know, like it's worth your time. You're putting a little effort in, obviously, but then they also get to gauge your ability without wasting too much of your time. Um, so then I think the next topic I want to uh, discuss is when you look at job descriptions, right? Um, it, are there any general red flags that usually pop up at you? Um, when you see those descriptions, it screams, okay, I'm never going to interview with that company run, right? Are, are there any red flags you look for? So I think like 79% or 70 to 79% of job descriptions are just bad and have a bunch of red flags. I think one, a recruiter um, just, and, and this is the irony, right? Because a lot of people, when you post your portfolio, your resume, it has to be super detailed. It, it, you can't have any shortcomings because companies are going to pass on you. But on the flip side, a lot of companies don't really pay attention to detail when it comes to their job postings because it's just like super generic, right? Super cookie cutter. If it's like a bunch of focus on tools and saying that you need to learn all these different frameworks, then it's a red flag in my opinion because I guarantee you the job does not have that at all. So that's the main thing that is a complete turnoff. Yeah. Any any other things that uh, sticks out to you? Um, for example, they... Um, well, for me, I think one of the biggest red flags that I, you know, that I see not very often, um, thankfully, but uh, sometimes I would see companies that require designers to code. Um, it's not in the nice to haves. It's actually in the requirements. And, and I can, you know, I can tolerate uh, companies wanting designers to do video editing, to do a little bit of motion graphics, but Personally, I think they're crossing the line when they put two very, very different jobs together and they think that that is um, something that is reasonable. And um, on the other side, the non-product design side, um, you know, the, the side when they want you to do video editing and animation, I think um, there's another tangent to it that um, some companies, they actually want you to do 3D. So having... 3D experience myself in my uh, design school, uh, you know, years, which I personally think that it's a totally separate skill set. It requires high level of specialty to even do elementary level of 3D work, right? I think that is crossing the line um, again. Um, I think, you know, the 2D motion graphics are okay. Those are, you know, easy to do in After Effects. You can spend a couple of months and learn it, but 3D is crossing the line. Um, do you, uh, is there anything in, in your book that's crossing the line? So I think it depends on the company. And if the company has something like coding, um, cause I, I, I think crossing the line would be that we blatantly want to pay you nothing. And, and especially if there's not a salary in there, cause I can see if they had mm -hmm. a salary, right. That was super impressive. And they were asking for, okay, we know that you're going to be the only designer here. So we want you to do all of this shit. Right. Mm -hmm. And, it's like, okay, yeah, that's definitely understandable. But if you're lowballing someone or don't even have the salary in a job posting, then that's crossing the line, in my opinion. But I think going back to you talking about like coding or 3D, I think that if they express why they need someone to understand code or understand React, that's fine. Because a company like DigitalOcean, you know, Datadog, right? Like Dev Tools kind of company, GitHub as well. I totally mm -hmm. get it. It, it, it fits yeah. that environment, it fits that narrative. Even like 3D, if you're working for like a company that's trying to do metaverse or something like that, <laughs> once again, I totally get it because they might, it, it might be a thing where you don't necessarily have to know it or you're going to be doing on it, but having a good knowledge and foundation, right, of that mm -hmm. stuff, being able to communicate with the 3D artists, right, or whomever. I agree, yeah. Doing it will be great. So I think a lot of job posting when they're asking for this stuff, once again, I think it's just the recruiter that's copying and pasting stuff. And a hiring manager is not being, you know, explicit with what he or she wants, right? And it's like, yeah. oh, 
we have this environment where we're building internal dev tools or something. So this person does need to understand code. They're not necessarily going to be doing coding, but if they understand how things like React works, right, or they understand things like how Digital Ocean works or how like APIs work, then that will be great because they're going to have to build these tools for developers to ship faster or something. So yeah, oh, yeah. I just, it's just a lack of communication. It's a lack of writing once again. And like I said, it's this this ironic thing where companies they want you to 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 have quality right with your resumes and not make mistakes and be attention to detail. But on the <laughs> side, they're not doing this with their application process, which is yeah, ironic. absolutely. I I agree with you um, because I think it's okay. To, uh, I just want to clarify my uh, personal position is I think it's okay to have you know to expect candidates to have these foundations, uh, to have a solid understanding of it, um, but. I think it's crossing the line to actually want them to do it as you know a reg on a regular basis as part of their jobs because that is technically two jobs, right? I know that we've evolved a lot since you know uh, probably twenty uh, twenty years ago because a lot of roles nowadays I think they are all hybrid, um, even if the title is not hybrid, um, you probably would expect some degree of hybrid work, um, not in terms of on-site or remote, but hybrid in terms of skill sets, right? But right. Um, the fact that if they don't know enough or if they know enough and they still have the audacity to expect that you're doing three person's job, right? And like you said, without offering you three times the salary, um, then that's something you know uh, that we would categorize as a red flag. Do, do you have anything else to add to it? Yeah. So how would you feel? Because I've seen this before with certain companies like ThoughtBot, for example. I think they're an agency. Mm -hmm. And they actually had, I don't know if they still do it, but when I was trying to break in, they actually had like their salary in a job posting and it was super high. But they were mm -hmm. asking for all these different things. So what if there's a company where they do need someone to do all of that stuff from a full stack perspective, but they have the money to back it up and they're showing yeah. that on the job posting. So it's like 350 all the way up to like 400 mm -hmm. or something. How do you feel yeah. about that? Yeah. I, I think that's a really interesting question that you post here. I think it's definitely more justified than, you know, in other situations. In most scenarios, I think they're not going to do that, right? But if they said, yeah, we're going to pay you like 500K, right? We're going to pay you 400K or whatever. That's obviously significantly more than most uh, positions, you know, in in this um, in this uh, in this you know uh, category, then yes, they can you know they they can probably find someone, but I I still would go to say that their candidate pool is still going to be smaller. Yeah. So they still need to adjust their expectation that they may find someone, but then they're going to be choosing from a limited candidate pool. That's not going to stop. I guess, like people from applying though, right? Because uh, plenty of people apply for every job that they see. But then when they really narrow down to people, they might still have trouble finding it. Um, and then on the other side of it, okay, I tend to um, find that people who are multi-talented, I've seen, I've seen people like that, right? Who, who are excellent in so many different things. They tend not to want to work for a company. They tend to be a huge influencer themselves. They tend to have their own business. So do they exist? They do. Can you get them? Maybe not, but maybe you will. <laughs> so that's, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it there. Yeah. And you know what? One more thing I want to say is that, yeah, asking, even if you're asking for all those skills and there's someone that has all of them, that person is still going to get burned out if, you're, if they're going to that job and they're being stretched really thin as yeah. well so yeah that's a really good point point. and i think something that we should touch on in uh, in another podcast is about a lot of companies just hiring a bunch of senior talent that, that are full stack designers but the mm -hmm. senior talent they don't have the i mean they don't have the ability to do meaningful work because now they're stuck doing the grunt work and it's that exactly. kind of situation as well so i know we haven't got into what happens when you get on a job kind of thing but that could be yeah. an interesting topic for like another discussion. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, today we're going to wrap up with one more discussion about the um, basically how junior designers and boot camp graduates, boot camp students 
can handle this type of、um, expectations, right? It, I, I think it's very daunting for someone who's junior, who's just trying to break into the industry, to realize that that's what they're up against. That that's the kind of expectations. Because I remember years ago,、um, I was at a conference and I just heard someone saying. You know, like we designers, we have to learn fifteen programs all at once, right? And and I laughed, but I know it's true. It is true, right? Like, and and you know, people from other industries, they might have to learn one or two. All of a sudden, we're expected to do fifteen different things. So, how can junior level designers handle this type of ex- ex- expectation? What should they do to position themselves, right? Like, how do they not overwhelm themselves at first? Because it is. Really, really difficult to you know kind of match up to this level of, of of expectation at a junior level. What do you think? What should they do? Well, I think I maybe we didn't talk about this before, but I think first and foremost, find the kind of industry that you want to work for. Find the kind of managers and people that you want to be around. The kind of environments that you need to be in,、um, so you won't have people pulling you in twenty different directions on how to create your own portfolio because there's no one size fits all. First and foremost,、um, find the kind of problems and areas that you're going to want to work on. So dig deep, because I'm just completely blown away, Stella. When I talk to junior product designers, and of course they don't know, because I also think that's the community fault, and that's another conversation for another day. But they really need to zoom in on: Do I want to work for an agency type environment? Do I want to work for an environment that moves fast, or do I want to work for an environment that's super proactive, right? And where we're planning. This project for like eight months, and it's going to be released in eight months. Do I want something that is filled with a lot of ambiguity? But I also get to experiment, right? I also get to call the shots on things and have more freedom. Do I want to go to an environment that's a little bit more rigid? So I think there's just different things first and foremost to look for, and I just think it goes back to what you said that these companies know that they're looking for the perfect person, but they're not going to find it, right? And I think from a A junior person, I think, is finding that T shape, right? So finding, you know, a breadth of skills where you can be a generalist in different areas when need be, and you can jump in and help in certain areas because you have like certain notes, right, about research, or you have certain notes about like content design or something. But you're really deep in one area, like visual design or something, or like even research, where you can help the company that you're at. And I would just say.、Um, Since there are a lot of startups out there and a lot of companies that that don't have a high level of design maturity, I would honestly recommend, especially the folks that's breaking into product design or that wants to get into the product design archetype, really focus on execution and focus on your craft because that's just going to take you a long way over anything. So even if you're lacking all these other skills that can be learned on the job, right, or that you can read through Nielsen or Norman,、um, just Spend your time focusing on on your craft and focusing on you know just working on a product team as well because those two things are just going to matter the most because collaboration and your visual craft is going to be table stakes for a lot of companies. So yeah, yeah, definitely.、Um, I I completely agree because I, I I feel like you know now the expectation is like you know a little bit of everything, right? And、um, it is not hard to. You know, touch upon a little bit of everything、uh, at an elementary level. You know, when you're studying, when you're、um, in your first or second year of career.、Um, but I think it's important that we do present ourselves with、um, in, in a lens that okay,、um, I know I'm at an elementary level or like intermediate level in all of these skills that you look for. But here's something I'm really good at, and I'm going to demonstrate to you how fast I can learn these other areas in. Uh, three weeks in three months, right? I think that kind of、uh, you know confidence and and the fact that you verbalize it, right? Like when they ask you, you the I, I think the you know the tendency that a lot of people have is they get、um, scared because they they were asked about an area that they really don't feel that confident in, and they're like, oh yeah, I mean I'm not really good at that, right? Like you don't want to say something like that. You can say that yes, I have. Elementary level knowledge in this, or I have like this, you know, basic exposure in this and you know X Y Z project. But here's what I think I can do in the next three weeks and the next three months. I'm confident that I can do it in the next, you know, coming months if you give me this opportunity. And honestly, that separates 
uh, this candidate from a lot of other people because from experience, I just know that people default to, you know, the answer that, oh, no, I'm not familiar with it. And then and then that's it. Right. So. So, yeah, I think junior folks, um, you know, it's easy to get frustrated, to get scared, to feel unfair that this expectation is there. But on the other hand, if you present yourself in such a way that, OK, I see that the expectation is there and here's my roadmap to reach it. Right. And also at the same time, um, you know, just be honest with each other a little bit, right, from both sides, um, to, to acknowledge that we all have limitations. Neither of us is perfect. We'll have a much better day <laughs> at the end of the day, right? Um, so yeah, that's, um, I, I think, you know, this is a, a discussion that we probably will have in some variation in future episodes as well. But hopefully, after this discussion, uh, folks who are currently looking for a job in the design field feel a little bit more confident and less frustrated at the expectations because it's always going to be there. It's human nature to have expectations, but um, it's not the end of the day. It's not the end of the world. Um, the you know the the solution is how you kind of let the other party know that hey. I can do it. We can all do it. But let's give it some time. Let's not expect everything to fall into place on day one. So I think that wraps up our episode today. Thank you so much, Carrie, for joining us today. And we will see everybody again in another episode.